Thank you. Okay, so uh, city count, city attorney uh, Quinn Barrow. Barrow. I'll give a report. What's this? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Call the meeting back for recess. It hasn't changed. Quinn Barrow uh, has an announcement coming out of closed session. Yes, Mayor. Now that we're back in open session, uh, the city council in the closed session on the item identified on the agenda gave direction. There's no other reportable action taken. At this time, it would be appropriate to adjourn that meeting. Okay, so that meeting is adjourned. Closed session, we're gonna reconvene it to open session. And welcome to the city council adjourned regular meeting. Budget and capital improvements program study session for Tuesday, May 14th, 2024. And could we have, who is gonna lead us? In the Pledge of Allegiance, you made eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> You're the one. Hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Do I get a pen? <laughs> <laughs> a round of applause. Okay, and may we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Lesser? Here. Councilmember Napolitano? Here. Councilmember Montgomery is absent. Mayor Pro Tem Howard? Present. Mayor Franklin? Here. Thank you. And uh, so, uh, Councilmember Montgomery uh, asked me to say that he is out of town but watching and listening on Zoom. Okay, public comments. Are there any public comments? Can I have approval of the agenda? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, approval of the uh, May we have a motion? So moved by Mayor Pro Tem Amy Holworth and seconded by Councilmember Lesser. Vote, please. Motion passes 4001. And now we go with public comments. Anybody here wish to make a public comment? Up to three minutes per person. Um, <clears throat> my name is Scott Yanofsky. Just a couple of things. First of all, beg pool. Beg pool needs to be cleaned up or rehab. It doesn't need to, another pool. It doesn't need to be de demoed. Just clean it up. Do the best you can. I know we have a problem with the uh, st school superintendent. Um, I'm sorry the state architect with, with what they're doing. But cleaning up is what we need to do. Next thing I want to just mention is the um, outdoor dining. That's, this is getting ridiculous with that. You know, they want more seats, more tables, <clears throat> wider sidewalk. Wider sidewalk means less parking for more people. It doesn't make any sense at all. Last thing I want to talk about, can you bring up those pictures? <clears throat> So um, I don't know if you know, but I built the 9-11 Memorial in front of the firehouse. <clears throat> and uh, I went over there this weekend, and I saw something that was absolutely disgusting and heartbreaking. Someone's trying to peel off the, um, mm -hmm. the plaques. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned it to the firemen. They said they're going to talk to PD. But, I mean, people need to be aware. If residents see anyone there doing anything that looks like damage, Please, please, wow. call the police. So this one, this one more, this a plaque they tried to peel off, and then the larger plaque, you got that also? And you see where they, they're chipping away at it. They're spending time there. It's not something that they do real quick. So please, just whatever, if anyone sees anyone there, please let's get it. Um, uh, call the police department, let's see what we can do. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Yanowski, would you, or maybe the clerk, like send all of us those pictures, because I'd like to put out on my social media, hey, folks, this is happening. Please watch up, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? How about online? There's no request on Zoom. Okay. So uh, we'll close public comments and move on to general business. Presentation of the proposed five-year capital improvement program for fiscal year 2024-25.
Director Lee. Public uh, actually, Mr. Mayor, uh, if I may, this is our first budget study session. And tonight we'll be going over the capital improvement plan uh, that Eric's about to go into. And then Steve Shirley and his staff will go over the operating budget. That'll include presentations by the uh, using departments, the department heads. Uh, so again, this is your opportunity to dig deep, answer, ask questions, and we're happy to uh, reply to those uh, with information. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, it's Public Works Department's uh, pleasure to present the proposed uh, five-year CIP update to you this evening. Um, City Engineer Katie Doherty uh, will be giving the presentation. Good evening, Mayor Franklin and Honorable Council members. Uh, Katie Doherty, I'm a City Engineer. I will kick it off here um, with a brief timeline of um, where we've been so far with the five-year CIP. On April 24th, we presented the proposed draft to the Planning Commission, um, who found no exceptions related to its consistency with the general plan. On April 25th, um, we presented to PPIC um, and received some great comments back from them. Um, here, May 14th, we will present to you um, the initial draft of staff's recommendations for the proposed uh, five-year CIP. Um, there are 94 projects and a funding plan of uh, just under um, $177 million for over five years. And um, staff uh, anticipates coming back on June 4th for final adoption of the five-year CIP document. So first, um, to start it off, in fiscal year 2024, um, we've completed 15 projects. It's been a busy year for us and successful. Um, just to highlight a few, we opened Fire Station 2. Um, we opened Polywog Lower Playground. Uh, we completed uh, several annual cycles of water, um, streets resurfacing. Um, we will be finishing the pier railing project uh, before June 30th, the end of this fiscal year. Um, and we opened the Peck Reservoir portion of um, Peck Reservoir project. We're still working on um, finishing up the treatment plant. So it's been a busy year. All right. Um, the five-year CIP is organized into uh, different categories. Um, the first, we, we have right-of-way projects, we have street projects, water, sewer, storm drain. Um, we also work on studies and evaluations of different um, elements of the city, uh, parks and buildings, uh, primarily coming out of our CIP fund. So um, in a snapshot, um, this five-year CIP um, represents $81 million in previously approved prior year appropriations um, for fiscal year 2025, the fiscal year that's starting on July 1st, uh, we have 32.9, almost 33 million in requests for funding, and um, 62.7 million for the out years, totaling 176-ish million dollars over five years. So a quick um, visual of where the funds are being spent. Um, the CIP fund, is on the top right in the navy blue, and then our streets, uh, sideways, and right-of-way projects are in the sort of teal blue. Actually, the colors are kind of different. Um, and then over on the left-hand side of the of the pie, there's storm drain, uh, sewer, and water, which is our which are our enterprise funds. So I am going to oh funding sources. Um, the CIP fund is um, funded primarily through TOT uh, parking citation city. Parking meters, um, grants, and other funds. Our enterprise funds, as I just mentioned, are the water, sewer, and storm drain. And um, we have a number of other sources that we use, several um, grant funds, Measure R, Measure M, Measure W. Um, we've got our undergrounding program, which is paid through assessments. Um, we've got the peer parking lot, uh, peer and the state peer and parking lot fund, um, amongst other outside sources. Okay, so we're going to kick it off with um, the CIP funds. Um, this is the AB uh, 27, what is it, 2766 fund and the CIP fund together. This is 30 projects, uh, $24 million, $25 million. Um, these are primarily buildings, parks, um, and some right-of-way projects are sprinkled in here. Um, so my plan is to go through... The entire, well, not the entire list. I'm going to focus on the projects that are new <laughs> this year, which are the ones that are highlighted in red. 
Um, I think you should have a larger version in front of you. This order's the same that's in this, this document as well. Um, the projects that are highlighted in red are new this year, and anything that is highlighted in yellow um, has, is either partially or fully funded by outside sources. So I'm going to start um, with the, the first red one on the list is uh, actually two new annual programs that we're proposing this year. The first is for park improvements and replacements, specifically for um, play, playground equipment. This is um, to start collecting funds for when the playground equipment um, meets its useful life and needs to be replaced. We will have a bucket of money um, set aside specifically to do that. And similar for the next one, which is focused on sports courts. Um, this is for resurf resurfacing sports courts at our parks. And the majority of the funding in this category, or, or in this program, um, were previously programmed in the operating budget for both of our, both um, Public Works and Parks and Rec had um, funding set aside for um, the sports courts resurfacing, so we're just moving that, excuse me, moving that into the CIP fund. Okay, uh, moving down to the next red one um, is the uh, sports court at Marine Avenue Park. This is to replace the pay and play facility, the existing pay and play facility. Um, demolishing that and putting a futsal court there. Mr. Um, Mayor? Yes. Hmm? What? 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 We approve this? That was going to be my question. I don't recall there being direction on the actual use there. So I was a little confused, as I think my colleague is as well. Okay. Um, if I can ask Director Layman. Futsal? Right? Isn't that the futsal? Layman's not futsal. here. Futsal? Or futsal. Futsal? Futsal. 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 I don't even know what it is. Futsal. It's a it's indoor like soccer. Soccer. It's like, court. So the proposal is to demolish the pay and play building and then put a futsal court in there, which would is in, like an outside uh, soccer game that you play with, with on with that facility. Uh, so I believe the approval was going to come if if you wanted to move forward with the project tonight as part of the CIP. Well. Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> so we've gone out to the public with this. We've had hearings on it at the, I mean, the last time we talked about this, it was going to be a multi-use. We're going to try different things there. And, you know, approval of this sh tonight should not take the place of a council meeting where we have people show up and stakeholders provide input and things like that. So we certainly can come back and have a fuller discussion about, about this proposal, absolutely. I would suggest, Your Honor, that we do uh, that. Parks and Rec did, uh, yes, the, the plan has changed in, in part because the Parks and Rec uh, Commission studied it and, and is making this recommendation as opposed to uh, the previous suggestion of, of activating in a different way. Yeah. So I'm sorry this is a surprise to you. My recollection is council expressly indicated that we were not going to program it because we had questions about a, a, a potential library, we had questions about many other uses, and deferred that decision. So I think it would be appropriate to defer that until there's more direction from council, let alone from the community, to get the input that council member Napolitano just referenced. Thank you. Yes. Right. Yeah, and I would Air just say sir. whether we you know, appropriate funds or not, it, we'd still want to discuss it because, as you said, perhaps keeping it as a, as a building for a library or maybe it's pickleball rather than football, whatever. But okay. so. The discussion was always going to come back to council. So just okay. Place. And I think it's part of the work plan also. Futsal is in the work plan? Uh, exploring the repurposing of the pay and play. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, moving on to the next one on the list, number seven, well, you guys are on the presentation at least, um, is replacing the fencing at Marine Avenue Park soccer field. Uh, this is a field that we just replaced the synthetic turf at. It looks wonderful. Um, so this next, is, next item is to um, replace the fencing around that field. Uh, the next item is Begfield parking lot resurfacing. This is programmed for some years out. Um, this is to... Uh, resurface the parking lot that services Beg Pool and um, and the Beg Field facilities. And yes, sorry, can we back Council up? Member, so, just want to understand since we talked about the um, the pay and play site, there's concern, as we know, on number five, Sand Dune Park improvements about a potential walkway there. Now, 
approval of this budget isn't going to signal a uh, approval of that, correct? So, no, the, uh, the design for the, the upgrades to Sand Dune, they're under development now. They will be going to Parks and Rec Commission in, in June, I believe, and coming to you in July. Okay. Thank you. So I'm sorry, what is then the line item that we'd be approving just to follow up? Um, this is a this is um, the 1.2 million that was previously approved for the project at Sand Dune. Um, we have because we're doing the, the master planning um, at the at the park, we're just bumping it back a year so that we can spend those funds now on something else. Thank you. And, and just to be clear, that that one million dollars is still programmed in the five year CIP for Sand Dune. Okay, um, so the, the next project, number nine on the list on the slide, um, is replacement of the light controllers at Manhattan Village Field. Uh, this is a project that was previously programmed some years ago. Um, it fell off because there was a lack of funding, but it just we just re-injected some uh, money into this project at the mid-year, so um, it's, it's showing up back on the list um, for completion. And moving down to the next red one on the list, uh, number 22, uh, City Hall Elevator moder Modernization Project. That's for this um, elevator here at City Hall to modernize um, that one with more modern equipment. Um, 23 is irrigation for tree wells in North Manhattan Beach. This is actually funding that we already had programmed in our operating budget and public works. Um, we're moving it over into the CIP. The tree wells in North Manhattan Beach are currently hand watered uh, with water trucks, so the idea is to bring piped irrigation and hopefully recycled water um, to those tree wells. And then the last red one on this list is upgrades to the electrical feed at the public works yard. Um, there was a surge some years ago that damaged the meter um, at the yard that we need to replace in, in order for us to do upgrades, any upgrades to the facility moving forward. And just a note, as it relates to all the projects in the CIP fund, um, as noted in the operating budget staff report, as it relates to the interface between the operating budget and the capital budget, um, there's a $1 million infusion of general funds that um, is funding all of these. Um, as well, uh, there's an um, uh, assumption that the council would want to move funding forward with bonding uh, the city's portion of the Scout House project once we get to that point. Um, and so those are two um, budget mechanisms that are allowing us to, to accomplish what is being proposed to see. All right, I'm going to move on to streets projects, which is the next category of projects, our um, street sidewalk and right-of-way funds. Oh, I didn't go. There we go. So we've got... Uh, $48.3 million pro programmed here, over 15 projects. Uh, this is for slurry seal, street resurfacing, intersection improvements, ADA improvements, sidewalks, uh, those types of improvements. Oops. So again here, um, focusing on the new pro projects that were not approved in previous CIPs. Um, number 11, Artesian Aviation. This is um, a project that has been approved and actually was completed in 2021. Um, we were able to apply for grant funding to cover some uh, real estate negotiations that were ongoing. So this is to reflect an appropriation for 350,000 um, to cover those real estate negotiations, including our costs related to that issue. And number 13 is um, Manhattan Beach Boulevard resurfacing or rehabilitation between Sepulveda and Dianthus. Um, this, again, was a previously approved project. Uh, we've moved it uh, from, I, I believe it was in the gas tax fund previously, we've moved it to Measure R in order to utilize some unreserved funds and accelerate the project to next year. So those are the major changes in this category of projects, which includes the measure with the gas tax fund, Measure M fund, Measure R fund, and the Prop C fund are all um, included here. Could I please uh, ask a question about number 12, even though it's not marked in red? Absolutely. Rose Cran's bike lane improvements. Um, is that gonna, will that narrow the lanes on Rosecrans going westbound and eastbound? On Rosecrans, no. Um, there are, there's an existing bike lane on Rosecrans going yeah. westbound. Um, so the idea is to connect the, the crosswalk on Sepulveda. There's a, there's a very small segment of, of, um, a bike lane that's missing there. So we'd just mm -hmm. be adding that connection piece in 
and then um, com continuing the bike lane down Highland, I guess north on Highland, and then west on 45th to meet up with the bike trail on the beach. Okay. Oh, then go. So, so you're going to have a bike lane on Highland now? I believe the, the proposal is share, share, a sharing lane, share rows, so we wouldn't be reducing traffic on that a, segment of Highland. A, a share rows on, the two, on one of the two northbound lanes on Highland from Rosecrans. Correct. That's what the project proposes, yes. That's kind of like a road diet. If, uh, well, that, that's, not, that's a major commute. It's not a road diet, but it's encouraging something they already can legally do, but do we want to encourage it? Because that's a very busy stretch, especially at rush hour in the morning. It, uh, there, this project has been awarded some um, community project funding through Ted Lou's office. Um, we have a million dollars in grant funding for this project. To paint sharrows on the road? And complete the connection at, at Rosecrans and, and um, Sepulveda and create the connection down 45th Street. So, I mean, this will be coming back to us too, right? Absolutely can, yes. All right. Well, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to move on from this category to the parking fund. So I will note here that um, the projects that relate to uh, Metlocks um, are housed here in the parking fund, so that's why you'll see some of the projects that are being proposed here are related to Metlocks. Um, so there's nine projects here total, a uh, total of 6.5 million. So the first one that's new is painting the Metlocks parking structure. Um, this is the two-level parking, Met lot M, uh, two-level parking structure at Metlocks. The second one is, well, we have two new annual programs that we're proposing as part of this um, this fund. The first one is for par parking payment facilities. This is um, annual money to spend on either our meters or kiosks or wherever we end up moving towards for collecting our parking revenue in the city. So this is, would be a funding source to support uh, those facilities. And then the next one is an annual parking capital improvements uh, program. <coughs> so this would allow us to do improvements to, well, I guess similar to the ones that we did on lot three a couple of years ago, which was some spalling repair could be used on lot for in North Manhattan, really any of the city's parking lots, this would allow us to make sure that we have money to maintain those. Your Honor, is the paint Metlock's parking structure, is that repaint areas that have already <coughs> been painted, or are we talking about painting areas that haven't, aren't painted now? I think it's a wholesale re repaint of the, of the parking structure. A repaint? Yes. Okay. And I have a question which we'll get into later, but I'm just wondering if these funds to try and uh, obtain funding in advance for anticipated future capital improvements are accumulating funds at a sufficient rate to be able to have enough funding for these projects later. In other words, do we need to look at that from a policy standpoint, whether there's going to be really sufficient money coming into these funds to be adequate, anywhere near adequate? Yeah, I, th I mean, I, from our best guess, they are. And, and we do think for some of these new annual programs that we're suggesting, it will take a couple of years to accumulate enough funds to say, you know, wholesale replace playground equipment. Um, so it, it, is, it will, but it, it allows us to have a place that we're starting to accrue that money versus having to come all at once and ask for it in one shot. We, we would have already accrued some for Thank it. Thank you. And, and I'll add that the... Uh, um, yeah, in the context of your question, lot three, we've got design money here. We don't have construction money, and so we're woefully inadequate in the long run for the big picture. Um, but this certainly accommodates um, everything else that we're looking at right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, so the next new one on the list is waterproofing the city hall and police uh, fire facility parking structures. Uh, we have some water intrusion coming into the parking structure where... Uh, you all park for the meetings, and also the one that's on the other side of the wall for, that supports police and fire. Um, so the idea is to waterproof that from, from weather and also the planters that are on, on the surface. So the next new one is number seven, um, redesign and repurpose of the Metlocks slab parking area. Uh, this is to repurpose this, the uh, fountain that's no longer being used as a fountain outside Nick's at uh, Metlocks. And then the last new one on the list is to replace the escalators at Metbox. 
question? Yes, um, Mayor Portem. Thank you. Um, and so I understand there's been uh, research done in terms of those escalators um, because I'm sure folks are concerned that these have been broken so much, you know, hopefully we're not just doing the same thing again. So I understand there's a different kind of escalator being considered, but also um, would it be possible, like what if we had a set of stairs there? <laughs> like, you know, we have an elevator, so we would still have ADA access. Has that been considered or? No, the op options are being considered now. Okay. Um, so we're, we're um, entertaining replacing the existing escalators with new escalators. There's a possibility to modernize the existing escalators. There's options to install elevators instead of escalators or possibly um, stairs okay. instead, of, uh, instead of all of that. So well, we're we exploring all the options. We ant anticipate a much more outreach related to okay, that moving great. forward. Okay. Um, so the next up is the state peer and lot fund. Two projects are programmed here. Um, neither of them are new, they're all both previously approved, but one of them is our ongoing peer railing replacement project, which we'll be wrapping up this fiscal year, and then next year we're intending to do a, a full-blown structural analysis of the peer to make sure it's still in good shape. So that is what's programmed there. This fund, uh, the Grants and Other Outside Funds Fund, is, uh, is a new fund that we're proposing this year. Um, this is to be able to track all of our outside funding, grants, and other sources separately from the other funds that are really city funds. So uh, we've collected all of the projects that have either partial or fully grant funded that don't have expenditures yet. Some of them are new. Um, but the ones that are not new but have been moved here are just uh, grant funded projects that we haven't um, started on yet. So I will. I, a lot of these are repeats because they also have funds and other, other sources. Um, so I'll just start up at the top. Um, the first one is the sports courts, which, which at Marine Avenue Park, which we discussed and we'll be coming back to council for further consideration. Um, number three is the Highland Corridor Complete Streets uh, Feasibility and Design. Uh, the city was awarded Measure M funding to study the Highland Corridor um, from a complete streets aspect. Which means what? Um, multimodal. No complete streets. And what are we talking about doing? Multimodal. Um, there, it hasn't. We haven't started yet, so it could be anything. But it's really um, different types of transportation, pedestrian safety, um, improvements to crosswalks, those types of things. All right. And I'll add that once the study is done, we'll come back and we'll get some 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 real feedback from the council on where you want to go with that. Absolutely. All right, uh, the next new one in this list is replacing the escalators at Metlocks. Um, for the purposes of this report, uh, we assumed a cost share with the Tolkien group of 75%, uh, 25%, but those negotiations, no, negotiations have not been completed yet, so um, this is just a, a budgeting um, assumption. Who, who, who gets what? <laughs> um, this, is, this is assuming that uh, we're paying 75%. Okay, city 75%. And then the last one on this list is intersection improvement projects that we received um, grant funding from the Highway Safety Improvements Program to study some intersection improvements um, at two locations in the city. Okay, uh, moving on to our storm drain funds. This is our storm drain enterprise fund plus our Measure W fund. And this is for capital projects related to maintaining our storm drain system and also for um, for compliance with um, water quality standards that are, have been imposed on the city. So there are 10 projects here, um, totaling 36 million. So again, focusing on the new projects being proposed here, the first is the Manhattan Beach Dominguez Channel Stormwater Infiltration Project. Um, you're hopefully familiar with our 28th Street Infiltration Project that um, we're about to um, go out for bids on. Actually, you'll be hearing a presentation on that um, next week. Um, that, that project is, is intended to address um, our water, water quality obligations within the um, Santa Monica Bay watershed. And so this Manhattan Beach Dominguez Channel watershed infiltration project will be its sister project um, addressing our water quality obligations to the Dominguez Channel watershed. Um, so this one hasn't started yet. We're just um, embarking on a feasibility study to see what that would look like. Um, but that's, that's what that project is to meet our, our obligations. Um, for that watershed. 
And then number four is the Beach City's Green Street Stormwater Infiltration Project. This is a collaborative project that we're teaming with Torrance, um, Redondo, and Hermosa to accomplish. It's being led by Torrance. And this is to install a number of green streets throughout the South Bay. Two of them are being proposed for our city. And um, this is actually a project that's been on the list for a while, but we're proposing increasing the funding. Um, they're planning to bid it this summer and anticipating that bids may come in high. We're programming a, a little bit more money for that to make sure that we can cover our aspect of that. And could you explain what Green Streets, what it means? Is it, is it just about the storm, how the stormwater drains? Yeah, green streets are usually multi-benefit projects that are typically targeted for treating stormwater, collecting the stormwater naturally and infiltrating it or, or, or otherwise treating it. It could be from mechanical means, but um, in this case, we're proposing dry wells and some bioswales, uh, more natural means for treating the stormwater in those locations. Our Street Light and Landscape Fund, um, this is not new, one project. This is uh, an annual program for maintaining the street lights that we purchased um, some years back, um, and we are not proposing any changes here. For the Sewer Fund, this is another one of our enterprise funds. We've got nine projects over, um, or 26 million over nine projects. This is to maintain our sewer pipelines and lift stations throughout the city. And I believe we only have one new project uh, programmed here, which is for upgrades to the programmable logic controllers, or PLCs. Um, this allows us to be able to monitor and operate um, our lift stations remotely. So um, that's the only new thing that's being uh, um, proposed here. I will mention that with the sewer, sewer funds, we are making a very strong effort to get all of our lift stations upgraded. So we've got um, Voorhees coming up very soon. Um, the Palm lift station, uh, sorry, the Pacific lift station will be coming up soon, so that a lot of our funding is um, focusing on upgrading those lift stations that are pretty old. And last but not least, um, the water fund. Uh, we've got 27.3 million over 15 projects. And this fund uh, funded projects such as the Peck Reservoir project, but also all of our pipelines. Um, pumping from our ground wells, uh, ground water wells um, in Redondo Beach. And here we've got three new, pro two new projects that are being proposed. Um, the first is the feasibility study for expanding the recycled water from Polywog Park to the medians on MBB. This was per council approval um, at the mid-year, so we're reflecting that here. Um, the second one, or it's number three on the list, is similar to the sewer lift stations. We have programmable logic controllers um, for monitoring our SCADA system on the water lift stations as well. So it's upgrades for that. And then the last is an annual program um, for maintenance of our groundwater wells. Um, we have two, but they're both located in Redondo Beach. And um, once we have our treatment plan at Peck Reservoir online very soon, um, we're hoping to maximize the amount of groundwater that we are pumping. So this is to make sure that we can maintain that um, into the future. That is my list of projects. Um, here's a quick map of what's going on in the city. This is actually a screenshot from the engineering's website um, on the Public Works Department's, linked from the Public Works Department's website. So these are all active links. If you click on it, it'll, link, it'll um, get you over to the project website so you can learn what's going on. So um, our recommendation tonight is to receive a presentation on the five-year CIP for 2025 through 2029. It's to review the list and attachments and direct staff to revise the list or to approve the five-year CIP as presented. And I'm available for questions. Okay. Questions, colleagues? Last one. Council Member Lesser. <clears throat> Council members received a sort of a late entry in terms of funding requests last night from the Oceanographic teaching station, the OTS, the Harrison Greenberg Aquarium, with regard to seeking monies from the city to assist on an ongoing basis with maintenance of the facility. That would be CIP, or would that be operational budget? I'll let Director Lee answer that. Even presuming there was an agreement as to what we're funding and an assessment undertaken, which is what I'm going to talk about in a moment. Yeah, if this is something that Council wanted to undertake, uh, I think we would do it out of our operating budget. Um, it's, it's, there's not um, you know, five-year planning that we would be doing. I, I think, if I, as I understood their request, it was more reimbursement-type funding for them. 
Um, so I think that would be my, my initial reaction. Okay. Um, next question for me has to do with what we started discussing, and that has to do with whether we're acquiring, absorbing, um, saving enough funds for some of these larger capital improvement projects going forward. And I was just wondering what your observation is. Continue again with, we talked about certain individually designated funds, but do we have enough, particularly when we're facing parking lot three, and how would we go about it? Because I think at the last council meeting we asked for some direction to count uh, the staff to come up with what that program might look like. You did, and uh, Finance Director Shirley, and we'll talk a little bit about that between CIP and the budget. But we've got some thoughts on that that the council can consider going forward for long-term funding. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council Member Napolitano. Thank you, Your Honor. And, you know, I talked last time about the fact that, uh, you know, we have these endless amount of needs but limited resources and how we're going to be able to afford this. And <clears throat> in my time on council, the list gets longer. <clears throat> it never gets shorter for CIP projects. We've got $177 million, right, in projects. It's only going to grow. That doesn't include a lot of the things we've talked about. It doesn't include outdoor dining. It doesn't include... Uh, necessarily a, a big pool as we know it um, or different iterations of it there's no way we're ever going to we if people want stuff stuff costs money and we don't have enough money we're never going to have enough money we're never going to be able to save enough money from the other things that we do to be able to afford this the only way we're ever going to do this if people want it is that we're going to have to raise more money to do it and I know we just did the storm drain um, measure, which helps alleviate, but a lot of that, what that does is, is preserve our reserves and also preserves our operating uh, money. It doesn't go to CIP. CIP, Capital Improvement Projects, needs a dedicated source of income from now to the future in perpetuity. The only way we're gonna get that is if the voters basically agree to that that's a necessity, and I think that we would have to add to our sales tax to do that. It's not something I say lightly or that I want to do, but if we're going to do it, we have to make a change here. Bonding these things, you know, sounds good, but that's, again, limited. It's limited to a certain project or projects, for a certain amount of time, and it just adds debt uh, on top of what we're already paying for other things. You need a new income stream, you need new money, you gotta look at either a sales tax increase, some sort of other fees that, that can contribute to it, but something is gonna have to change if we're ever going to be able to afford all these things. So, a quarter cent sales tax is what, 2.6 million? So, Half cent sales tax go from nine and a half that we're paying now to 10% would raise 5.2 million a year, which you could also bond for um, to accelerate projects along the way. But until council and the voters agree to do something, all these things are going to be dreams. They're not going to be actual things that happen. I have a question, question. just a follow-up question to that. When you talk about and I know this is just for, for discussion. This is not something we would. Right. But a question about that sales tax is that isn't there also a way to direct some of the money that goes to the county from the sales tax and capture that for us rather than raising a sales tax? I've never heard of that. Okay. I thought there was a mechanism. Uh, David, or council member. Maybe I'll run through the city manager, and that is, <clears throat> I thought there was a cap on how much sales tax can be charged, and there's a cap on the total quarter. amount, and as a result, some cities have argued that the cities should raise their own taxes to get up to that cap. That's what I'm thinking about. Is that what you were referring I think to? That's the right. cap's 10 and a quarter percent. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's what I think that's right. And if we don't, let's say we decided not to do that, the, the county could decide, that's what it is, the county could decide to raise the sales tax and we don't get, you know, it goes there. So. Correct. Right. Got it. Thank you. I'd get, I knew I'd get there. 
Okay, any other questions? I, I, I have one. That oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Yeah. To complete the thought, though, I think um, we talked last time about a survey. I think we have to include that in the survey for the pool for the outside dining. For any CIPs, I think we have to include the idea of raising revenue through a sales tax increase to see what, how that pulls and whether it's worth pursuing or not because it could be I'd put on November that. ballot. Yeah. And would you, could you, um, much like a UUT, you can earmark stuff or you can say this money is dedicated, so this money could be dedicated to CIP projects? We could say that. It's a tax increase, so it could be used for anything, but I think that council, the city should dedicate it to CIP only. Otherwise, we're never going to get these things done. If we dip into it for really all hard, these yeah. little things, we, we have the, the other, the storm drain is supposed to free up general fund money for those other things, leave it as that. This should be dedicated to CIP and all the things that the residents want and hope for the future of Manhattan Beach, in my mind. Um, I'd support, I mean, put it on the poll, survey, whatever, get the information. Thank you. I'll leave that for discussion section. Okay. Um, so, so two quick uh, questions. So the pier railing replacement, um, it's essentially paid for but not completed. Correct. So yeah. when will it be started? How long will it take? It's started. Um, we have um, done some work on the staircases. The north staircase is open. Um, the south one we're working on. The piers, the new railing themselves are anticipated to be delivered next week and installed very quickly. Next week. Uh, next week? But yes. How, this, how long is it going to take? That's going to be quite a project, about isn't it? About two months. About two months to really? complete. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, expecting, we're expecting it by the end of the fiscal year. Okay. July 30th, June 30th. So we're going to start it in summer, <laughs> during summer. <laughs> Um, is it, and, and how is it going to be performed? Is it going to be closed down half and work on half? And They're going to be doing 500-foot um, segments at a time. Is that right, Gil? 200-foot segments at a time. 200-foot segments at a time, they're going to demolish it, fence it off, demolish it, and replace it all at the same time. So they're, they're never leaving any section of the, of the railing that will be not there. There will always be, always be railing there, and they'll make, they'll make their way around. Okay. The pier will remain open. Um, we're going to have to move some of the furniture from side to side, benches out of the way and all that stuff. But the pier will remain open the whole time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then, um, so those two staircases, I thought they were being, were, were we directing that, that project? The staircases were, yeah, they were wrapped into the pier railing project okay. overall. Yeah. Uh, it's bare wood. Is it, is it going to be painted or treated or something? or? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's treated for. I don't want to have to be replaced. Sorry, them let me again let me call uh, Principal Engineer Gil Gamboa. This is his project, so he can uh, answer that better than I can. Right. And the kids will miss the splinters. I know. No, I just want to. Hi, to last. Principal uh, Gil Gamboa. Um, so the staircases are wood staircases. There, the temporary wood handrails are just temporary until oh, we get okay. the aluminum new railing in. So when you uh, build a staircase you need to measure feel measure at that time once you build it because if you do it per plan Sometimes the railings not going to come out exact so so will it be the supports for the hand railings as well? Will so the hand railings metal? will be aluminum just like the what's on the pier Uh-huh, and then the staircases themselves are marine grade pressure treated lumber. Okay. All right, great I was amazed I was watching it. I don't know how they met, matched it met up with the with the pier plaza Exactly. So, that was pretty interesting. Engineering is magic. Yes, that's great. Okay, and, uh, and this is um, a, a question, a request, and a comment maybe. But um, as Councilmember Napolitano mentioned, you know, this is all going to take a lot of money. We're not going to be able to do it all at once. Um, we need a, other funding. But could, could this or is it already in... in uh, <laughs> Uh, aging order, in other words, like the, the priority order, like the highest priority thing, the thing that's most likely to 
like big pool, okay? You know, that really needs our attention, that kind of thing. Uh, is this in that kind of order? Um, it is in, in terms of where the, where the funding shows up. So highest priority, the way that we've prioritized it, you'll see funding in next year, or either prior year appropriations are coming up next year. Um, and then the funding will show up in later years as the priorities as we see it. Okay, but, but the priority of that project is based upon it falling apart or needing to be replaced, that, that kind of thing. That's, that's kind of what I'm asking. Right, yeah. It's um, facilities that have come to their useful life and, and need attention. Okay, and, and so, so that is in that order then? Yes, yeah. Um, particularly uh, for our infrastructure storm um, sewer, we, we do master plans almost every 10 years, and, and that sets our priorities for those projects. Um, they prioritize what needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. So we try, we follow our master plans as closely okay. as we can. Same for street, street rehabilitation, it's the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions? Okay, public comments? We have a waving match here going on. No, no you go, no, you go. Why don't you come together? You can hold hands. <laughs> Council, I'm Jonathan Tolkien with the Matlocks Project, and I just wanted to say I appreciate the partnership that we've created to enhance downtown. Now, the project opened about 19 years ago, and I think it's been a great amenity along with the downtown for all the residents and visitors. And um, after 19 years, there's things that need to be done. We're working closely with Public Works on some of the cosmetic upgrades to the plaza right now and certainly um, the things that are on the capital improvement budget like the escalators that we've had problems with I think cleaning up the garage in terms of at least starting out by painting stairwells um, the fountain area since we have decommissioned the fountains you know just upgrading the fountains I don't necessarily think as a if it's not broken don't fix it is kind of my mentality so I don't want to see any of us spend money where it doesn't need to go. So like for instance, the fountain area that's also been like a park type area in Metalogs, I think just needs some basic cosmetic work, doesn't need major improvements. And really with very limited resources, we're doing a lot right now for this summer. A few things like the escalators take a little bit more. I'm in favor of that. Um, I'm also in favor of studying the possibility of a stair in lieu of the escalators. But I don't necessarily think that we want to start ripping the garage apart to add more elevators if we pull out the escalator. I'm good with the one elevator and stairs or keep the escalators the way they are and just it works pretty well. Don't, let's not, it's not broken, let's not fix it. So I'm here if there's any questions of me. I'm now living down here. I'm around, I'm available. You have my cell phone number. Please call me anytime you need to if there's any questions about anything. Our partnership with the city, I think, has been great, and we continue to go, I think, on our side, above and beyond what our agreements require. And with 11 minutes, 11 minutes left, <laughs> seconds left, that's it. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Jill Lampkin, Executive Director, Downtown Business and Professional Association. Um, and. First, I want to say I know how much work goes into this, you guys. I mean, this is insane. And um, thankfully, Eric is kind enough to have a monthly meeting with me so that we can go over all of these things. And one of the things I wanted to throw out there for, for the three non-staff members that are here um, is that I feel like Eric is doing a really good job of looking, because as we talked about today, the escalators versus stairs versus elevators. I'm like, okay, so it's been 15 years, so what's our plan in 15 years for the next time this has to be replaced? And so I wanna make sure that everyone realizes that I feel like Eric really is thinking in those terms. So it's like, okay, if this has taken 15 years and now we have to replace it, we know that in another 15 years we have to start thinking about how we're gonna fend that if it's over a matter of, of you know years or whatever. But I do also want to take one second to say that I went back through a bunch of, you know, files and we're, we're talking about, you know, the outdoor dining, which is actually a complete overhaul of the, the downtown. And the reason that people move here, the reason that people visit here is the vibrancy of what is downtown. And to call it just outdoor dining is 
a little disingenuous. And I, can, I went back to my files, and in 2014, we spent $125,000 on a consultant to tell us we should have wider sidewalks, more lighting, and some public seating areas, and some outdoor dining. Um, in uh, uh, 2016, we spent another uh, $225,000 with the Urban Lands Institute to tell us the same thing. And if you put that into real dollars today, we just keep spending money to tell us the same thing, that the downtown would be better if we made some of these enhancements. So it's not just about outdoor dining. I think it's a bigger plan that we need to be talking about. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any... Anybody else of the three that are here? <laughs> no? <Sorry. Okay. laughs> uh, how about online? No request on Zoom. Okay, thank you, Martha. So, uh, colleagues, <clears throat> comments? Wrap up? On to the next thing, right? The budget. Yeah, just go to the next budget. What do we, uh, so h how do you want the vote on this? Do you want this to vote on this? On the next item and take okay. your comments on Okay. So it's a workshop. We'll run down Steve Cherillion. Right. All right. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Right. You know, this is more of a workshop, right? I mean, we're not. We're not approving anything like this. Okay. Okay. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Franklin, members of the City Council. Tonight is budget study session number one. Uh, we provided the uh, proposed budget last meeting on the 7th of May and went through the highlights. Uh, tonight is an opportunity uh, for the department overview. Uh, you'll be hearing from each department and you'll be hearing about their expenditures by program, their department performance measures and metrics, uh, and key objectives for fiscal year 25 as well as investments in service delivery, maintenance, infrastructure, which are included in the budget. Um, this is an opportunity to ask questions at the end of each department uh, presentation uh, or at the end. Um, it is a well thought out spending plan. The uh, items that are included are a necessity for the operation of each department. Um, with that said, uh, I wanted to uh, just cover one area that uh, was discussed to, on May 7th, which was uh, including uh, with the proposed budget uh, was introduced. The uh, city council requested that staff uh, take a look at long-term capital financing and how to accomplish funding goals, uh, as well as ensure long-term fiscal sustainability. Although we have some options tonight in the staff report, we request some additional time to thoroughly review the funding needs for the capital uh, and developments, de develop some options and strategize with our financial advisor and finance subcommittee to return with a plan to city council over the summer. Uh, some of those options uh, to develop capital funding are outlined in your staff report. Uh, one is to allocate a portion of the year end general fund surplus. Another is to reduce financial policy uh, for reserves from 20% closer to the GFOA recommendation of 17%. There's also revenue enhancement options such as sales tax increase or utility users tax increase, which are uh, part of your city council work plan uh, as the second part to the storm drain uh, fee increase. Uh, so um, in addition to that, uh, to capital, as uh, Director Lee mentioned, we are transferring a million dollars to the capital uh, improvement fund from the general fund, as well as uh, made a commitment over the next four years to transfer another million. Uh, but it's just not enough, as Councilmember Napolitano indicated. We need a, a funding source, a recurring funding source, uh, to be able to uh, foresee the future of capital needs in the city. Um, with that said, um, happy to answer any questions you may have uh, before we begin with the uh, department presentations. I guess the one comment I would have is we're not the only one facing this sort of challenge. Other cities face the same challenge, and I'm wondering what are the different approaches? I think was mentioned by 
Councilmember Napolitano. It may well be that it is a dedicated tax going to these funds, but I think our city has been proactive with certain funds in trying to accumulate revenue. But I'm just wondering what other cities do to face this classic challenge. Is there's not enough revenue to do all the things that any city would want to do. So I welcome in your report, when you report back, maybe a little bit broader survey of how other cities have approached the same problem. Certainly, and uh, there was a mention of survey that we're currently working on that will be released to the public, and one of the items will be a sales tax. But to answer your question, what cities are doing, I did reach out to other cities. I have a peer group that I work with, and Hermosa is doing just that. They're putting a sales tax measure on in November, mm -hmm. and uh, that is strictly for capital improvement. So it is something that is a relatively... Um, you know, it's, it's utilized by communities to be able to get a recurring uh, funds to do these large capital projects. Even when you go to debt service on these, you still have to pay the debt service. So uh, unless you have a dedicated fund, and it doesn't have to be sales tax, there's a, a, other things, that, as I mentioned, um, but it's not going to solve the problem because you need recurring revenues, right? So, um, but we'll definitely take a look at that and when we report back as to what other cities are doing for funding. But uh, from my feedback that I got from my peer group, which is uh, uh, limited to the South Bay, is that they're looking for revenue sources such as a sales tax measure. Thank you. Um, so, so I have a question uh, on top of that. And how does that measure pass? Is it a two-thirds to increase the sales tax? If it's a specific... It's a, if it's a specific tax, it would be a two-thirds tax. If it was a general tax, it would be majority plus one. Right. Right. What happens, though, a lot of times, they'll put an advisory uh, measure on along with the sales tax for the general where you put a question to the public, should this be set aside for exclusive CIP use? Right. And, you know, if it passes, then that generally is passes as well. Didn't we do that for the... Uh TOT seem to remember some language like that. We did, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, so, the uh, the fifty percent plus one in light of the taxpayer protection uh, measure that's that that may that is probably going to make it to the to the ballot if that gets passed and it's retroactive and everything has to be two thirds. Yeah, we're, we're monitoring that right now. We, we don't know the specifics. That could potentially be what could happen. It is retroactive to January of 22, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but we're monitoring that right now. We, we really don't know. We're uh, doing an assessment as to what we're looking at if it does pass. But we just don't know. But it will be two-thirds is the general idea. Right. Okay. If it passes, it's going to end up passes. in court anyway. Yeah. yeah. That's going right. to be too major. Okay. Any other questions? Um, appreciate that. Um, so again, we're going to go in department order, starting with uh, management services uh, and ending with information technology. All the department heads or representatives are sitting behind me in department order, and we're going to start off with uh, management services. I'll turn it over to George. Good evening, Mayor Franklin and members of the City Council. My name is George Gabriel, uh, <coughs> assistant to the City Manager, and I'll be providing tonight's presentation regarding the management services department budget. It's in a different section. Page 208. So for your reference within the budget binder, the management service department budget is located on pages 85 to 116. And your uh, green budget binder. Yes. Oh. I'm okay. looking in the Under blue. management services. <laughs> but it's also in the blue. It's also in the other. Anyway. Uh, correct. It'll be in the blue. But the reference, the department heads will be referencing page numbers that are specifically in your budget binder. Can we use a smaller <laughs> font? I can still read this a little bit. 
So we'll begin with a breakdown of department expenditures by program. Uh, management services consists of five divisions, elected officials, city manager, civic engagement, city clerk, and city attorney. You'll recall that just last year, we consolidated uh, the city council and city treasurer division budgets into an elected officials division, and we also added a civic engagement uh, budget as well. Uh, within the department budget, 16 positions are allocated for a total budget amount of 5.2 million. Moving on to performance measures, <clears throat> which you, you can find in the green budget binder on page 90. Um, I'll highlight a couple of these. So as you can see, the first two of them are largely dependent on resident ratings provided by our survey that are not available this year, but as we typically conduct it on a biennial basis, they'll be provided next year. Uh, we typically aim for 90% uh, ratings on both of those. <clears throat> and then just to highlight some of our communication efforts, uh, the, city, the city continues to see growth on our communication efforts and the primary social media channels of Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, known as X. Um, increases range from 3 to 38%, depending on the platform. Most notably, Instagram continues to see significant growth, estimated at 38% this year. So regarding our what we call by the numbers in terms of our hard data and our output as a department, well, obviously we're a citywide department, but see, these are the ones that are specifically relevant to management services. Uh, I'd like to highlight a couple of them. So we continue to see a large number of public records requests. We completed 2,946 on a citywide basis. Uh, <clears throat> we maintain an inter in email distribution list of 14,000 emails. We processed 455 agenda items in 2023 executed 408 contracts last year, an increase from the 302 contracts in 2022. Uh, followers on Instagram increased from 14.5,000 to 18.3. Uh, homelessness continues to remain stagnant, but it's only done by our outreach efforts um, that the city council has continued to invest in. Uh, we assisted 97 unique homeless clients in Man Manhattan Beach, increasing from 90 from the prior year. And I'd like to highlight some of the key objectives uh, of the Management Services Department. Uh, some of these are ongoing. Obviously, uh, City Council places a large emphasis on community priorities, infrastructure, which we discussed today, and the work plan items, public safety. Um, we're going to take specific objective as it relates to community engagement, promoting uh, participation and collaboration on stakeholders to contribute to decision making. And you'll see a uh, key investment that we'll highlight as well. Uh, continue to address city council direction on homelessness and equitable solutions that balance the business use, business use of public right of way, improving the city website, usability and design, uh, transparency of coastal regulations and public records request software systems, uh, and lastly, providing prosecutorial services as needed to address crimes not preempted by the state, um, such as uh, trespassing, graffiti, illegal shopping carts, public urination, public nuisance, and smoking in public. These are all things that are included within the scope of the budget, and the city attorney's budget has been, or has been uh, increased to reflect that additional prosecution. So on the investment side, I'd like to highlight two that amount to $61,750. These are technology investments, both of them. Um, the first one is a citywide cit uh, citizen and staff engagement software amounting to $50,000. And so the city continues to look at a variety of ways to engage the community. One particular software within this investment is an AI uh, engagement and experience platform software. Uh, obviously, the city is well accustomed to using you know, pro uh, software like SurveyMonkey, but these are designed to collect quantitative data with question types including scale, drop down, comment boxes, and so on. <clears throat> and while these are open-ended questions, they lack the sharing and rating and the dynamic uh, ability uh, that we see other softwares providing. And so we're proposing, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, we're proposing a software um, that one of many softwares, but one is that we brought up is Thought Exchange, and we're hoping to use it internally and externally. Um, and we're hoping they'll easily aggregate insights from a broader range of perspectives and contribute to that dynamic uh, decision-making and trade-off uh, uh, discussion that we can benefit from as a community and internally. The second one, amounting to $11,750, is 
is uh, net file modules for AB1234 ethics training and boards commissions application processing. Mm -hmm. This will assist the, the city with ensuring compliance with the required AB1234 ethics training and the other is for the management of our boards and commissions processes. Uh, both modules are specific to the city clerk's duties and would assist their office in automating deadlines and communications as well as tracking required documents and uh, uh, commission member history as well. With that being said, that will conclude the Management Services Department budget, and I'm available for questions. Councilmember Lesser. Speaking of citizen and staff engagement software, I have a question. Go back maybe two, three pages to the metrics for management services. <clears throat> We're going to say the same thing, I bet. Go ahead. I'm just curious if the software would allow past numbers to be presented along with current. So you can see on the right, it has past data about homeless count, homeless assistance in MB, but when it comes to the number of public records completed, city council meetings held, forward boards and commission, we just have this immediate past year. And my recollection is there was prior, previously, in prior years, at least presentation of the numbers, which gave us a, a sort of a sense of are we going up, are we going down? Does the software enable the past data to be added? Well, uh so that software they were referenced is more on a public engagement side as it relates to, know. you know, the by the numbers. Um, I'm unsure if the software has that capability, but um, it's certainly numbers and data that we track uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, what this is kind of meant for is a kind of a freestyle and, and really highlighting certain data points. But obviously the city keeps track uh, on a year to year basis of what we do as it relates to public records requests and so on and so forth. And even this sort of high-level presentation would be helpful to have an idea of whether we're going up, going down. And I recognize if the software doesn't support it, this software, then you can't do it. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem Haworth. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Slightly different. I just want to point out that you actually drilled down to inform us that there's been 106 hours and nine minutes of city council meetings <laughs> in the past <sighs> year. And I suddenly feel a lot older than I did before I looked at that number. So. It feels like 105. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. Great information. That's is all. It, is that it? Okay. Um, I don't want to make this go any longer. If I may, we have uh, Instagram. <laughs> On uh, that page, uh, the slide six or page 210, you have Instagram uh, <laughs> followers, 18,000, 18.3 thousand. Um, again, it would be helpful to get the metrics you know, to see the growth pattern on that, to see what's, what's successful. But uh, the other thing that might help is, you know, residents versus non-residents. I can't believe that this is, you know, half of our population is... You know, I would love to have half the population on Instagram, but I got to believe that it's some out of town, which is good too, because that's people can making you, can inquiries. Can you tell that on Instagram? I don't think you tell the location. Well, they, they could probably tell you anything <laughs> if, if, if so. you purchase metrics, right? But but something like that would be helpful to see if we're really you know hitting residents versus visitors. Visitor information, like I say, is very important. Um, so just. As you're accumulating these statistics, that would that would be very helpful. And obviously, Instagram wins, right, over Facebook. Yeah, Instagram is definitely a, a primary uh, a primary form of communication, not only for the city, but one that the residents as well as uh, visitors utilize. Mm -hmm. What's Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> you know that uh, it's kind of like a printed newspaper, uh, except interweb I don't thingy. Have it. All right. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? We exiting. Okay, thank you very much, George. Good evening again, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, Steve Sherlane, Finance Director, and I'll be presenting the Finance Department. Uh, so uh, you can follow along on your green budget binder starting at 117. Uh, our program expenditures, we have four programs. Administration, which is, uh, channels the budget and the financial reports. Accounting, which does our payroll and AP and audit, as well as our year-end ACFR. Uh, revenue services is uh, cashiering, utility billing, uh, accounts receivable, and as well as customer service and purchase and procurement. We have a budget of about $4.8 million and 20 full-time positions. 
our performance measures. I'm going to highlight a few of these, um, although they're all uh, similarly important. Uh, our first one is to continue our AAA rating. Uh, we reaffirmed that in 2021. Helps us when it comes to uh, debt service and, and borrowing. Uh, also, uh, to attain an unmodified audit opinion, that's very important to us on an annual basis. It's the best possible opinion you can get. And we have an interim and year-end audit uh, annually, and uh, we strive to get that opinion. As well as uh, attain our uh, budget awards, which is very important, I meet a certain criteria developed by the GFOA and CSMFO, and we get that annually, and uh, we're, we're very proud of that. I want to continue doing that. Some of our analytics, um, uh, a lot of numbers here because uh, we're out facing when it comes to uh, resident centric. Um, we have 87,000 utility bills and notices that we mail out annually. We get about 4,900 phone calls on a monthly basis. Uh, we are cashing transactions annually, about 13,000, so we're, we're still seeing some activity there. Uh, we issue about 4,000 parking permits, and uh, we issue about 4,600 accounts payable checks to our, our different vendors annually. Our key objectives for fiscal year 2025, uh, to complete a comprehensive user fee and cost allocation plan update. We're working through that right now. Uh, we last completed the user fee study in 2020. This process allows us to recover costs for services that we provide. Uh, the timeline for this is to be delivered to the Finance Subcommittee in November and City Council in December. And most all departments will be involved in this process. Next item is uh, continue to improve short-term rental program by adding efficiencies and ensure operating compliance. Uh, we're working closely with our partners in community development uh, to ensure compliance. And we've grown this monthly submittal from uh, just a few to 130 uh, at our top side. Uh, this program now brings in over a million dollars annually. Uh, initiate uh, RFP process for city uh, leases and transit occupancy tax, uh, hotels and short-term rentals. This includes the studios. Um, this audit takes place uh, periodically to make sure that the municipal, municipal code is being followed as well as our agreements that are uh, being adhered to. Uh, implement a uh, financial transparency portal. Uh, we're excited about this. This portal gives us the ab ab ability uh, to put on our website for anyone that's interested to view summary of our financial data for complete transparency. And it's part of our uh, implementation of, for our ERP solution. And last but not least, it's our last major uh, financial module, which is our licensing module. Uh, we started uh, the Munis Enterprise Solution uh, implementation uh, in 2020, and this uh, we're hoping uh, by the end of this calendar year that we put in the last module, which is business licensing, and, and complete that four-year process. Uh, we have a couple. Uh, couple uh, we have a service delivery investment, which is included in the budget, and this is to uh, add a account specialist. This is to offset. This is offset by a part-time reduction in hours. This is currently a. Part-time worker working between 30 and 35 hours a week, so it's an incremental increase to get it to uh, net new full-time. Uh, this is much needed for our frontline customer service to support the gr growing demand of short-term rental program, as well as our digital water meter customer support. And the other item that is included in the budget I just uh, mentioned as a key objective, uh, which is $65,000 uh, for the land lease, uh, TOT, and studio audit uh, that we will commence next year. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Sure. Colleagues, anybody? Um, I just have a couple. Um, 4,900 phone calls a month? Correct. That's like how many per day divided by 20 is 250 a day? Uh, we have a work, a work, <laughs> we have a work center uh, on our phone calls, and it's uh, tracked a little bit differently because we, we have six phone lines that come in, and uh, the analytics tell us that's what we're getting calls. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Okay. And then a uh, perennial question uh, people always ask, how much do we make on our parking citations? Uh, the, we issue them. They're $53, and then we pay out, I want to say, uh, we net out about $39, so we, we pay out about 14 to the state for construction funds okay. so on, a, on a monthly basis. So we net out about $38, $39 of the $53 parking citation. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome.
Okay, good evening, City Council. My name is Lisa Jenkins, and I'm your Human Resources Director. We are a small but mighty department of eight full-time employees, and we have the privilege of supporting the city's most valuable resource, which is our employees. Um, you can see from this first slide here that the majority of our budget is actually dedicated to risk management, and it comes out of our insurance fund. The reason for this is because all claims, including liability and workers' compensation, are paid out of that insurance fund. I'd like to take this budget um, presentation opportunity to very briefly talk about some workforce trends and recruitment trends that we're seeing. Um, to that end, I'd like to point your attention to the top um, performance metric. Um, so you can see that our time to fill, and this is the time between when a recruitment is opened and when a referred or eligible list gets sent to the department, has remained pretty static the past few years, around 30 days. Um, I just wanted to point to your attention that prior to 21-22, this um, turnaround time was actually about double this, and we've been able to reduce that time um, despite having three to four times the volume of recruitments that we've had in the past, and that's been with a focus on efficiency in recruitment. We've automated our online application system um, and evaluated our process. Um, on this slide, I'd like to point to the years of service chart here um, as it highlights some of the other um, needs that I'll be discussing. Um, you can see on the breakdown of full-time employees, so this is based on our active employees as of March 1st of this year rather than our budgeted employees. Um, employees with four years or less is around 44% of our total employee population. And if you carry that out to employees with nine years or less, it's around two-thirds of our employee population. So I think this um, chart here underscores the need for enhanced training and development for our city employees. Um, in addition to the increased volume of recruitment, we, um, with that, have an increase in the number of promotions, which is... Um, an opportunity as well to provide supervisory and management training to our newly pr promoted employees. Um, moving on to our key objectives in the coming fiscal year, um, as I mentioned, we are hoping to continue to expand staff development opportunities, enhance our training and development, both on uh, mandated trainings as well as other professional development opportunities. Um, continue to expand our employee wellness programs as well as our employee safety program. We will be preparing for negotiations next year with four um, full-time bargaining units. Um, those contracts, if you recall, shifted from a calendar year basis to a fiscal year basis, so those are set to expire in June of 2025. Um, and then along with that, uh, we hope to make significant progress on updating our rules, policies, an employee handbook, and have an opportunity in the negotiations to tie up any um, loose ends with that. Good luck, you guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, we have eight full-time employees. We have been able to keep up with our increased demands um, with our employee population increasing um, through um, really dedicated and qualified part-time staff who we've been able to retain as well. Um, with the emphasis on training and development, our request is to add additional part-time dollars to support a training and development uh, part-time position that will have a dedicated focus on those staff development and training opportunities. Um, we do have a healthy training budget, which I'm grateful uh, to the council for, and with this, we will have resources as well dedicated to making that a priority. Um, we also would like to add um, a part-time budget for an HR intern, which will be um, staffed as needed as we have interest. Um, recently, we had a human resources intern who was appointed to a full-time human resources assistant position when we had the vacancy. So that's a good opportunity to um, cultivate uh, professional staff into our office as well. Um, and then we are over time increasing our line item budget for administrative investigations. That's something that wasn't historically budgeted, um, and it is something that um, obviously we're required to um, do if we have employee uh, complaints that are brought to our attention. 
Um, and then we have a couple opportunities um, to enhance our employee um, wellness benefits and offerings. As we've discussed with council um, over time, um, we are always looking for opportunities to provide enhancements and incentives to our full-time and part-time employees when possible, and really focus on those um, programs that have a relatively low cost but might provide um, a little bit of interest on the recruitment front, a little bit of something that maybe other agencies don't do that we can do. Um, in this case, this covers um, what's called an active and fit membership, and that is a um, kind of flat rate service where employees um, both have access to a um, once annual um, wellness related item like a Fitbit or you know yoga set, things like that, as well as um, subsidized or um, covered gym memberships. Um, so that's something that will be a really nice um, benefit for our employees. Along with that, we're looking into an enterprise um, membership for Calm, the Calm app, or a related um, app that basically provides um, meditation and, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the sleep stories that they provide, but... Oh, yes. Okay, so this is something that yep. um, provides for employees as well as all household members access to um, that Calm membership at a um, significantly lower rate than somebody would pay through the App Store. So um, just a few extra enhancements that we're looking at. Um, definitely our employee wellness program has shifted to having more of a uh, emphasis on mental health and overall wellness, and we're always looking for opportunities to enhance that. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sort of similar to, I think it was Councilmember Lesser, but back to um, the kind of your metrics, the very, this graphic page here. Um, yeah. So under risk management, we have work workers' compensation claims filed at 41 and liability claims at 37. And do we know how those compare to years past? I would want to come back to you with that information. I think they've been relatively static, but I can provide um, updated information to council. That's useful. Our our budget overall hasn't increased okay. that significantly. Great. Uh, council Member Lesser. I so I wanted to follow up on this first key objective for fiscal year 24-25, and that is to continue to expand staff development with training and development opportunities. Can you talk about what that means? Are we talking about education programs, off-site, online? Are we talking about additional supervision and training? What, what does that actually mean? It's a combination of all of those things, as well as um, expanding um, management level coaching opportunities. So, um, I mean, this could include anything from um, coming up prior to July 1st, we have a workplace violence prevention plan requirement that we're required to provide staff training on. But with that, we're um, adding on de-escalation training and customer service training for our staff, as well as active shooter prevention training. Um, this, you know, includes required training like harassment training and OSHA training, um, but it also includes, um, for example, last fall we did a supervisory and management series where we had um, a mandatory session for all supervisors and managers. We're offering that again. Um, we're looking at a program that would have an emphasis on emerging leaders like lead positions or people who are aspiring to be supervisors. Um, and then also we have virtual offerings through various companies that we contract with. Um, so it's really looking at kind of a holistic approach to that development. And the online offerings uh, offer the opportunity, for example, if there was something noted in somebody's um, development plan or performance evaluation that they need to improve in an area that we could provide resources for online training or coaching that relates to that. So it's really taking a look at all of those offerings. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, looks like no more questions, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And... <laughs> I will be turning it over to Senior Recreation Manager Melissa McCollum, who will be presenting for Parks and Recreation. Thank you so much. Good evening. And before we uh, move to Parks and Rec uh, budget information, I just wanted to quickly remind Council and the community about two upcoming events. We do have our Older Adults Health Fair on Friday, beginning at 8.30 at Jocelyn, as well as our annual camp out at Manhattan Heights this weekend. 
Uh, but back to the Parks and Rec uh, budget information, which if you'd like to follow along is on page 159 of your binder. And as you know, within Parks and Rec, there are uh, five program areas, admin, rec services, cultural arts, sports and aquatics, and our community programs. And within community programs, that covers our older adults program, transportation, as well as our volunteers. We have 21 full-time staff members and no anticipated change for fiscal year 2025, as well as over 150 part-time and seasonal staff. We have a budget of, of $11.3 million um, and also projected revenue for next fiscal year of $4.6 million to help cover the cost of some of those programs. Much of that revenue does come from our reservations as well as our sports and aquatics programs. In terms of performance measures, which are noted on page, page 164, uh, we did conduct an older adult survey uh, this, this past year with 95% satisfaction rate. We are also anticipating 35 public art projects this year, which is a mixture of utility boxes, murals, sculptures, as well as progress to the Bruce's Beach artwork. <coughs> In terms of department uh, analytics, we have had continued strong enrollment, almost 18,000 class registrations, continued high use of all of our parks and facilities, including almost 70,000 visits to Live Oak alone. We have over 400 volunteers with over 24,000 uh, hours of service, and many of those fall within our older adult programs, uh, teaching classes, uh, facilitating conversations, and offering other opportunities to connect. So we really thank them for their very impactful service. We have over 9,000 youth sports group participants, as well as a very strong social media presence with over 24,000 total followers. Well, so back to the previous page, um, it says department general fund revenue equals at least 35% of expenditures. The estimate for 23-24 is 39%, whereas the prior year was 54%, the year before that was 48%. We know why the big drop off? Yes. So in the past, uh, that percentage, I believe, was uh, calculated without inc including the insurance allocation, the citywide insurance allocation, which can vary pretty widely year to year. A bigger capture of the actual cost? And so, yes. So now right. it is including that. Okay. So in terms of our, our key objectives, we are in the process of developing a strategic plan to outline priorities, <coughs> uh, maintain open space, and proactively address infrastructure investments. Uh, we've, had, we've completed team and community meetings to develop the three strategic priorities, investing in our people, maximizing and enhancing our facilities, and elevating our programming experience. And each will include strategic objectives to, to help accomplish each priority. We also plan to update the comprehensive Parks Master Plan project to include short-term, mid-range, and long-term projects. This will be accomplished uh, in partnership with Parks and Recreation Commission as well as Council. Plan to collaborate with LA County Library to explore the feasibility of Cultural Library in East Manhattan Beach and continue to expand class offerings and older adult programs. Staff has worked with the Beach City's Health District to provide expanded older adult programming. In addition, uh, we've developed many new programs, including camps, special activity uh, classes, and artist workshops, but we want to do, do even more. Also plan to repackage and finalize the Bruce's Beach artwork request uh, for proposals. The Art and Public Places Committee has updated the RFP. The item is temporarily on hold during the cultural arts manager recruitment, but during the recruitment process, we hope to bring in a facilitator to help move the, move the project forward. Finally, in terms of department changes or investments, uh, we have been searching for a software platform to provide a better user experience uh, for our registration system, and we do plan on piloting a reservation app in the coming months. And second, our chairs at Jocelyn are, are currently in poor condition and definitely in need of, of replacement. So new chairs will be easier to clean and maintain for the wide ranges of uses from our daily programming to, to use at some of our special events. So that does conclude my presentation, but I am available for questions. Okay, no questions? Okay, thank you. Actually, I did have one. There had been an exploration with the older adult programs to make better use of other facilities beyond just Jocelyn Heights, as well as some partnership with the Beach City's Health District at AdventurePlex. Can you provide any insight in the status of those discussions? 
So I do know that they're under development. I don't know that they've been implemented at AdventurePlex yet. But um, our senior recreation supervisor is working closely with Beach City Health District um, about options. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor Franklin and members of the City Council. I am Andrew Enriquez, your captain for the police department. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present the police department's budget on behalf of Chief Johnson. Uh, if you'd like to follow along in your uh, budget book, it's on page 199 is where it begins. Our proposed budget for fiscal year 2024-25 uh, starts on 199. Our proposed budget is approximately $39.4 million and includes 120 full-time positions. As you can see, 64% of our budget goes toward personnel costs, which are the boots on the ground. Police department programs include administration, which also includes records, technical support, dispatch, investigations, crime prevention, and the school resource officer program. Uh, patrol, which includes, includes jail operations, traffic safety, which includes parking enforcement and animal control, and our asset forfeitures and grants. And looking at our uh, performance measures, which start on page 204 in your budget book, uh, violent crime is up slightly compared to last year, which is a trend that law enforcement agencies across the state are seeing. Property crimes are trending lower this year than last year, and we are working hard to fill open positions. Uh, since July of 2023, with the <coughs> assistance of our Human Resources Department, we've filled 15 full-time positions. Uh, in looking at our at analytics, I'm really proud of our team at the Police Department. In 2023, we responded to over 16,000 calls for service and made over 19,000 self-initiated service contacts. Our volunteers in policing donated over 2,800 hours of their time in service to our community. Our records section processed over 2,400 public records requests, and we continue to connect with our community through a robust social media presence and push messages out through our public safety notification system, Everbridge, which was formerly known as Nixle. In looking at our key objectives for fiscal year 2024-25, we will provide training and leadership opportunities for sworn and civilian personnel as well as attracting and retaining outstanding employees through focused recruitment, hiring, and training. We will complete the 2023-2024 Police Department Strategic Plan goals and report to the community. This includes a focus on three key goals, implementing proactive crime-fighting strategies, collaborating with the community through engagement and community partnerships, and employee development to ensure that our team has the tools and training they need to provide the highest level of service to the Manhattan Beach community. We will coordinate patrol and detective response to crime trends. And this will include providing directed patrols and developing proactive crime fighting strategies to reduce crime and improve the quality of life in Manhattan Beach. We will enhance usage of crime reduction technologies, utilizing the technology to enhance the delivery of public safety services. And we will continue to promote, and, and promote traffic and bike safety through enforcement and education. The police department budget includes investments in public safety vehicles and technology that will ensure our officers have the tools they need to keep the community safe. In light of potential threats to crowded events, the practice for modern law enforcement agencies is to staff a crisis response team at each special event comprised of SWAT personnel, an armored rescue vehicle, and medically trained officers with first aid supplies. Currently, the Manhattan Beach Police Department SWAT team has no armored rescue vehicle. The purchase of a rescue vehicle will allow for it to be deployed at all high-profile events and used during emergencies. At high-profile events, it will be equipped and used uh, with medical supplies and staffed with a minimum of four SWAT officers who are trained in tactical emergency medicine. The budget also includes three net new, fully outfitted vehicles to address shortages as we work to achieve full staffing. Lastly, our automated license plate reader technology will be installed in all patrol vehicles to increase officer safety and aid in investigations by automatically alerting officers to nearby wanted and stolen vehicles, as well as vehicles driven by persons who have been reported missing or at risk. We are not requesting any additional full-time positions, and I'm available for your questions. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem, Howard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to, uh, let's see, it is page, it's again, it's a cute page, the page with all the visuals. Um, 
page 238 in the blue binder and whatever page it is in the green binder. Um, I know that the police chief has highlighted this before the public uh, before, but I also want to highlight that um, there were 19,430 self-initiated service activities, which means that our police department, um, our officers, our patrol officers, um, whether it's traffic stops or you know, notice something suspicious, um, initiated those call without being called. So I want to really point that out because I think that's a really important thing for the community to understand. There were 16,664 calls for service, but again, on top of that, our police department initiated 19,000. So that's really important. Now, on those calls for service, um, those calls for service, are those the numbers that go to our RCC or they, are they also the numbers that go to our non-emergency number or is that the same thing? That is the same thing. So there's several numbers to get to RCC. There's the non-emergency number, there's 911, and there's uh, you can call our front desk and our front desk can transfer you to the Regional Communication Center in Hawthorne. Now, is it the, the front desk? So, and I'll admit, um, I didn't realize that the non-emergency number went to the RCC. And so, you know, I might call and say, hey, there's some suspicious looking guys or kids on e-bikes at the Vons parking lot. It's not actually maybe a crime yet, but I wanted our folks to know. But that just goes to RCC, and then they relay it back to us. Have we ever had it where we had a non-emergency number that was really a non-emergency number that was local? So I've been here since 1998. Longer I don't, than me. I don't remember a time when we actually dispatched calls out of our station. Okay. However, the watch commander's office is right next to the front desk, and there is usually someone in the watch commander's office. And I know for myself, when I had worked as the watch commander, if I would hear a call come into the front desk, I would immediately get on the radio and just put out, hey, calls coming into RCC about a shoplifting at Vaughn's, go ahead and start units that way. Right. So as the call is being transferred to RCC from our front desk, we already have units going that way to at least start to get information. That's helpful to know. And is that if I call the front desk as opposed to the watch commander? Or is that the same thing? And I apologize. I mean, I'm, you know. No, it's okay. I, I realize that the police department is very confusing and it has to be to be open for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But no, no criticism. Just Always calling the front desk will get you a person to answer the phone, a live person. If you call the watch commander's office line and there isn't a watch commander in there, the front desk will answer that number. Okay. And the non-emergency number is considered the front desk? The non-emergency number goes to RCC, the 310-545-4566. Three, okay. Yeah. I need some more numbers. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Councilmember Lesser. Captain Enriquez, one of the highlighted expenditures for this upcoming year budget is the SWAT rescue vehicle. And I wanted to better understand, I thought there already was a vehicle for SWAT. Am I incorrect about that? So there is a, there is a regional armored vehicle uh, that was shared by all the South Bay cities. It was purchased almost 20 years ago. Uh, it's pretty much reached its end of life, although we still use it because not all of the South Bay cities have an armored vehicle. Uh, most cities are going to that. Hawthorne, uh, Gardena, uh, Inglewood has several. The, a lot of agencies are going to purchase these because they're recognizing that, for instance, when we have the pure fireworks, we have four armored vehicles here positioned in different parts of downtown because realizing if something happened uh, south of Manhattan Beach Boulevard, we wouldn't want to drive a vehicle that's parked on the north side all the way through this crowd that's trying to get out of an emergency. We would already have a vehicle positioned on the south side of Manhattan Beach Boulevard. So it's, it's helpful for us to have our own to allow for those numbers to happen because as it is now, if, if we have a multi-jurisdictional uh, event happening, it's sort of a race to who can reserve the regional armored vehicle first. Okay, that answers the question. Thank you. Yes. So, um, so on the same subject, uh, how many times do you think that's been deployed or would be deployed? Um, well, off the top of my head, I know that we deploy it every fireworks. We deploy it for hometown fair. We deploy it for uh, the downtown uh, pier lighting, north end MB, uh, the open houses, downtown open house. Um, 
most large scale special events, pumpkin races, we, we have a vehicle out there with four, at least four trained personnel that are also trained in medical. Uh, you know, when this all originally started, it was just an armored vehicle, but we realized pretty quickly that if we can train in, in medical emergencies and tactical medicine, we can actually, uh, you know, help bring medical aid and, and assist the fire department with that in a, in a quicker manner than we used to be able to. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Mike Lang, your fire chief. Tonight I'll be presenting the fire department budget. No, we're good. So if you want to follow along, I'm on page 231 to 264. Um, so the fire department comprises of five divisions, uh, administration, community risk reduction, uh, fire operations, emergency, med excuse me, emergency medical service, and support services. We have a total of 41 full-time employees with a budget of about $18.7 million. And for our um, uh, notable statistics, follow along in 234 on this as well. Um, some of the highlights, I'd like to highlight our, uh, actually our annual inspections. Um, when I came on as your fire chief in 2021, we were about 26% of our inspections were being done. The last two years, we're gonna hit 100%. So we're meeting our um, state mandates and our other business inspections as well. And we're remaining down a little further as our five, uh, under five minute response time, there was a typo. It should be just under five minutes for the 2023-24, as reflected in our next slide. So our um, statistics we would like to um, showcase, we consistently are um, seeing our call volume increase. This last year, we were a little over 4,000 calls um, with our, like I said, a response time of under five minutes at 459 average. Um, you can see our, our bulk of our calls, our EMS calls, about 2,400 calls. Um, we have about 6,600 uh, hours of training divided between EMS and fire operations. And our August remain, remains our busiest day of the, or excuse me, month of the um, year. Saturday, the busiest day between 12, between 12 and 1 p.m., our busiest time of the day. And going again, giving our fire prevention and now known as community risk reduction a um, ton of props. All state mandates of 423 were done 100% this year. They provided 117 construction inspections, 16 studio inspections at our movie studios. And um, the big number is our 459 um, plan reviews in-house. Previous years prior to this year, the most we've ever done in-house was 42. So what that provides is a quicker turnaround. Also, we're not contract out, contracting out to a third party provider and in turn paying them. So we're retaining all that um, cost prevention or cost recovery in-house. <clears throat> Some of our key uh, objectives this year is to maintain a high level of operational readiness for emergency response through training and employee development, um, complete all state mandates and operational permit requirements as mandated by the state. Uh, um, we're consistently reassessing our current EMS delivery and opportunities to increase efficiency and you, at mid-year you did approve a uh, second um, ambulance and we're in the um, process of um, flying those positions now and as of today we're at uh, roughly 47 applicants so we're hoping to get those on soon um, we're going to complete our um, local hazard mitigation plan here soon and then our next phase would be um, our emergency operation plan um, so our service delivery investments year is really concentrating on employee retention and our succession planning. We'd like to add a um, fire department intern, which will be really concentrating on assisting our emergency preparedness administrator on this emergency uh, operation plan and local head mitigation plan to free up some of her time. Instead of data collection, that person will be doing that and should free up her to do um, better use her time. Um, upgrade our senior, our, our manager analyst to a senior analyst position uh, again, for employee retention, she's working far above what she's doing now, or what, uh, her position now. And then 
for succession planning, upgrade one of our fire inspectors to senior inspector, which would clean, which would create a step, which would be the next step before um, going to fire marshal. So the total cost of that would be forty-two, or excuse me, forty-nine thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars. Um, some other investments we'd like to do is our increase our wellness program. We're looking at, um, like I said, looking long term. We we do a good job at our physical fitness, our medical exams, but we want to tie in, and we do have an on-call um, psychologist that um, firefighters can call at any time. But we want to take a step back and and start that process as we bring them on in our mini academy, and then there'll be a wellness check every three to four months, and so really, and then do a better job at um, physical fitness training, medical training, and our ultimate goal is to reduce our um, our work comp numbers. So in, in results, a good investment up front to reduce our work comp numbers down the line. Um, $30,000 for, again, for the updated emergency operation plan, and then uh, an $18,000 investment to replace um, AED batteries throughout the city. We have ac community access AEDs throughout the city, and the batteries, some of the batteries are starting to, to need to be replaced, and as well as um, food and supplies for our employees in case we do have an emergency and we do need to um, open up the EOC and some of that food is starting to expire and we need to replace that. So the total investment there would be 127000 just shy of $128,000. We have no new full-time employees, and I'm available for any questions. Okay, colleagues. I just have a random question, Chief, and that was I was asked if all of our parks have AEDs that are accessible to the public, and if so, are they well marked? Mm. And I'm not sure who would know that. I mean, who's who has responsibility for the AEDs? We have responsible for AEDs in partnership with our Park and Rec, and I'm just getting. And I can follow all up of with them. You. We are actually assessing different ones, and we're actually assessing putting one at um, Jocelyn Center that can be checked out for activities at the Little League field and at the seniors play softball and other events at the big fields. So they can go check it out. Mark and I have been working on that together. Director Lehman and I have been working on it together to put one there that can be checked out and taken to and from the facilities. Okay. I can follow up offline, but that was a question a resident asked me. Thank you. Chief, could you just uh, give me an idea of the trend? Like uh, this year was 4,026 total calls. Is that pretty similar, you think, to the year before? Or? Uh, the year before was the number at 3857. Mm -hmm. Oh, line. I see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was looking at the right hand. All right, great. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No? Thank you, Chief Lang. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, Talid Mirzakanya, and your Community Development Director. I'm pleased to present our department budget for the next fiscal year. To follow along with our department budget, you can turn to pages 265 to 300 of your budget binder. Community development is comprised of building and safety, planning, code enforcement, traffic engineering, environmental sustainability, and administration. The pie chart on this slide demonstrate our, demonstrates our expenditures by program. As you can see, building and safety, the division in which we review and issue all building permits, accounts for 44% of our expenditures, about $3.7 million. The planning division, responsible for all land use entitlements, compliance with zoning and coastal regulations, environmental review, and long-range policy development, accounts for 22% of our expenditures. The remaining, we have... Um, 16% for the administration program, which manages and provides operational support to our entire department. Code enforcement accounts for 9% of our expenditures and protects the welfare of the community by ensuring compliance with city construction rules, municipal codes, and applicable health and safety codes. Traffic engineering accounts for 6% of our expenditures and is responsible for the safe and efficient movement of people and goods on the city's transportation system. Environmental Sustainability Division, which accounts for 3% of our expenditures, strives to create a healthy, sustainable, and resilient city while furthering the city's long history of environmental leadership, policy, and stewardship, both as a community and as a city government. The Community Development Department is comprised of 39 full-time positions, and our pro proposed total expenditures for the next fiscal year is about $8.3 million.
Our performance measures are outlined on page 270 of your budget binder. I'll highlight a couple of these for you tonight. We achieved 100% success in completing building inspections by next business day. We also reviewed 99% of code enforcement service requests within two days, both of which surpassed our targets. You'll notice that we have reported 65% success in achieving our goals for building and planning services turnaround times during this fiscal year versus 54% the prior year. The 65% reflects where we were at two months ago when we first reported this. As of today, this number is actually at 71%. This performance measure is made up of four categories. One of these categories is the first round of building review for complex permits. Our first round building review is currently at an 86% success rate. What's bringing our performance measures down at this time are the two categories that require a 48 hour review time frame, some of which we have not been able to complete in time due to a long standing vacancy of the plan check engineer position, which has been incredibly challenging to fill. These include minor plan checks and solar permits, for example. But as demonstrated by the progress, the department is continuing to improve. The department is committed to continuing to improve in this category, and we have made great strides as of seven months ago. The statistics on this slide capture, well, just how busy our department is and the volume of work conducted within our department. Just to highlight a few of these, we have issued over 470 major residential permits over 43 commercial, commercial permits this fiscal year and over 1,800 minor permits. We have conducted nearly 17,000 building inspections and closed over 1,000 code enforcement cases. We have processed over 220 planning entitlement applications, over 300 residential building records reports, and over 250 Public Records Act requests. Wow. Our department's key objectives for the next, next fiscal year include Complying with legally mandated state housing requirements, which includes implementation of our adopted housing element. Overseeing major development projects, including projects um, that, were, that are coming through based on our newly adopted residential overlay zone. And key economic development projects under construction, which include Skechers um, and the Hotel on Sepulveda Boulevard. We'll also continue to proactively enforce targeted issues for example, illegal short-term rentals. I'll now, now highlight some of the service delivery investments included in our proposed department budget. We are seeking one new full-time employee, a permit technician. This is a critical position for our permit services in that the permit technicians are the first to review and screen each and every permit application and the set of plans before they are routed for review ensuring that all required materials have been accurately submitted in the correct format and that they are, and they are also the last step in the process ensuring that the review has been completed by all parties and all necessary documentation has been received and fees paid for before issuing the permit in august 2023 the city council authorized an overhire for this position we quickly secured a new permit technician and have been operating with this overhire position since then to demonstrate how tremendously helpful the overhire position has been, I'd like to share some numbers with you. In April 2023, the permit take in, intake process was ranging between three to 25 days, depending on the complexity of the permit type. Similarly, the permit issuance phase was ranging between five to 36 days in January. By December, 20, uh, by December of 2023, the permit intake phase had been reduced to two to five days, and the permit issuance phase had been reduced to two to five days as well. The overhire position has played a significant role in allowing the permit technician team to maintain all of their processes at a time frame below five days. For this reason, we are requesting to make the overhire permit technician position a permanent one. Other investments include the, included in the proposed budget that would come from the general fund include securing Energov related consulting services at $25,000 for the fiscal year. Energov, of course, is our permitting software. This consultant will be utilized as needed only to provide the city with best management practices to optimize efficiency in the permitting system. 
That includes hardware and software upgrades. I'll note here that the planning and building programs are offset by cost recovery fees, and we look forward to engaging in the upcoming user fee study with our colleagues in the finance department, which will further right-size our user fees. Thank you for your consideration of our department's budget, and I am available for questions. Okay. Colleagues? I have one. Director, over the years, community development would sometimes contract out with third-party companies that would assist staff because the staff is so loaded and so busy, even with this added permit position. Is there a need to continue to consider that sort of service to augment the capacity that's currently available in the department, particularly with some of the vacancies? We currently are utilizing four consultants for our building and safety reviews. Um, it, even the consultants, it, it's been challenging with them because they've also been having trouble mm -hmm. securing staffing and securing staffing with the right skills to be able to review and analyze um, the complex permits that we're seeing coming through our, our permitting process. Um, however, we do have four consultants. Uh, we will be going out to RFP to be able to gain some more consultants on the building and safety side. Again, all of those costs are recovered. All of those costs are deferred to the applicant. So the city doesn't spend anything on those consultants. That's why I asked. Um, Thank and you. we, are, we yeah. are looking for some more to help us <coughs> processing um, on the engineering side, particularly because we've had the Planchik engineer position open since November, I want to say, November of 2023. We are not receiving any applications. It's been tremendously difficult. Um, we are doing our best to get someone in that position to help with the turnaround time for some of those minor permits that I mentioned earlier, um, but it has been increasingly challenging. I'm aware of that opening. Is that because there's competition for this type of skill set and this type of individual who's professionally trained in the private sector or multiple government agencies are all sort of competing for the same talent? Um, I've reached out to co former colleagues, even on the private sector side, and um, those ones particularly who offer these types of services to municipal organizations and um, even they are having challenges finding this expertise right now. Thank you. Uh, Director Mercer County, um, could, uh, could, could you break down the permits to um, uh, new complete homes? Like approximately how many complete homes are being built? Um, uh, new single-family residences annually? Just, yeah, Is yeah, that the question? Yeah, yeah just, just a guess. I'm trying to relate this to increase in property taxes, which then can in increase, you know, the revenue into the city. And so let's see. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't About 120. Out. 120 brand-new homes. Yes. Old one, knocked down. New home. Correct, correct. Okay. And I'll, I'll just note that the types of homes that we're seeing in Manhattan Beach are not your standard single family home, which of course. Um, <laughs> we all chuckle. The, yeah. the, the review of those types of homes becomes more complex because oftentimes, more times than not, they include basements, double basements, um, they include vehicle lifts, um, particularly in the coastal zone. Um, they include 800 amp electrical panels, and so all of those things complicate the review. Right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? No. All set. Thank you. 120 homes. All right. Well, good evening again. My name is Eric Lee, your public works director. Um, as you know, the Public Works Department, uh, our budget is uh, among the most complex in the city organization, and it takes a team to put that together, and so I'd, I'd like to recognize all my colleagues in that section of our circle here for all the hard work they've done to get us to this point. Uh, in Public Works, our mission is to build, maintain, and protect our small beach town community with a passion for excellence, and so this budget is um, definitely proposed with that in mind. Uh, we've got a variety of programs. Um, we, obviously, we have uh, administration, engineering, street maintenance, buildings and ground maintenance, uh, street line landscaping, water, storm, sewer, fleet, and parking facilities. Uh, the budget we're proposing is uh, just over $79 million um, with 77 full-time positions, which is a, a one-position increase over what we currently have, and I'll get into that in a minute. As it relates to 
our performance measures. Uh, we, we have a variety. Um, I'd like to point out this is the second year in a row that we're um, going to be awarding 100% um, of the construction contracts we've planned to do for the fiscal year. And so very thankful for our engineering group and the work they're doing there. Uh, we are planning to hit 25% um, of distributed water coming from our own city wells by the end of the fiscal year. Um, and it's possible we, we might not hit that, but we're making great progress. Um, and once we have our water treatment plant up and running, um, we're hoping to do even more than that. And I'll get into that in a minute as well. Um, and then I'd also like to, to point out the fact that uh, we continue to address uh, reported graffiti within one business day, um, sometimes same day, sometimes same afternoon, um, and we're filling all of our potholes um, within two business days. Uh, and so that really helps to Great. make sure Manhattan Beach stays uh, well maintained. As it relates to some of our numbers, um, we uh, received 36,000 calls at our administrative office last year. Uh, we had 84 council agenda items that you're very aware of that we've brought to your attention. Uh, our engineering group is responsible for public works inspections, and they uh, conducted almost 19,000 um, private development and utility inspections last year. And these are really, um, you know, what I like to refer to as some of our guardians at the gate, making sure that the utilities are following our rules. Um, in our field operations group, uh, we painted almost 28,000 linear feet of uh, curb paint last year, uh, which is uh, it's outstanding because we now have a paint truck uh, that we can do that internally and, and make sure that um, the paint on the curb is actually refreshed. It's five miles. <laughs> and then um, we also won our American Public Works uh, Association Award for the, the crosswalk project at Highland and Rosecrans. So that's the picture there. As well as the key objectives, um, as I've mentioned to the council before, we've got you know, nearly 150 work plans and public works we're trying to accomplish. This is just a, a really high level, um, sometimes summary of what we're trying to, to, to get to that we want to bring to your attention. Uh, the first one here is improving public engagement outcomes related to department projects. Um, this is an area that uh, my management team has identified that we really uh, continue to have some gaps and we want to close that. Um, and with that in mind, our focus for next fiscal year internally in public works is going to be telling our story, both internally and to the community. And so very excited about that. As the council is aware, uh, we have a number of work plans um, that you've assigned that are um, assigned to public works, including the beautification of our business districts, exploring uh, kiosks and other metering solutions for parking, um, and then community education as it relates to um, recycling and organic waste. Um, as City Engineer Darty mentioned, we've got 94 unique capital improvement projects that we're trying to complete over the next many years. Um, and then our water treatment plant, we are on the cusp of getting that um, up and running and uh, we're looking forward literally in the next few weeks uh, to be treating our own water and putting that into our water system. And then our, our plan is once we normalize those operations to come back with to, to the council uh, requesting direction to explore um, getting more water rights so we can um, be more self-reliant and also uh, reduce costs associated with the water fund. All right, so as it relates to service delivery investments that we're proposing, um, there are many pages of them, and I'm going to hit the highlights that I think you'd be interested in or the no more noteworthy ones, um, but I'm happy to, to drill down on to um, any other ones that you'd like to. Um, on part time employees were asking um, for um, some hours uh, for some office assistance for the tune of $59,000. Um, as you know, uh, with organic recycling uh, being a state mandate, uh, we have a uh, tall hill, hill to climb as it relates to SB 1383 compliance, and so we're requesting $200,000 to hire some consulting services to really address um, scores of action items that we've got to um, accomplish to make sure we stay in compliance with state regulations. Um, we're requesting $165,000 for cloud-based irrigation software. Um, our irrigation system is year to, uh, is end of life, and uh, really we need a technological upgrade that's going to help us manage the system better, we'll be more efficient, um, on the staff side with ours and uh, more water efficient um, for the environment with that. I'm looking for $140,000 to improve traffic markings. Uh, this relates to a large contract the council approved uh, a few months ago. Um, and it's just, to, it's really just to make sure that we can um, keep the lanes painted, our stop bars painted, and that the streets look good. Uh, we're proposing $100,000 to increase tree planting. Uh, this relates really to make sure that we're not getting behind on the urban forest. Um, and we need to not only um, replace trees that fall down, um, but we want to expand that canopy. 
Um, landscape services uh, for ninety thousand dollars. Uh, there's a number of these that are split between funds, and so I, I think this is a hundred thousand dollars overall. But ninety thousand is here for the general fund. Um, we're anticipating as uh, we're negotiating new contract for landscaping services uh, that we're going to need more funds for that, and so um, this is what that anticipates. Um, Seventy-five thousand uh, dollars to improve park maintenance. This really relates to supplies and materials that we need to to uh, maintain great parks. Uh, the red house. Um, Seventy-five thousand dollars, looking to replace the roof, um, that is definitely end of life, um, and then do some interior work, and also um, with some uh, display cases and other furniture inside uh, to help maintain the city's historical collection. And um, janitorial services, we're out to bid on that um, by the end of the fiscal year. We're looking for uh, additional funds that we think that those costs are going to be higher. Um, and then there's also. Let's see, a project mates construction program management software. This would be a software that is split between all of our funds. Um, it's $100,000 in aggregate, and uh, really uh, looking to make sure that our engineers have the right tools to manage a, a, a high workload um, and hopefully improve effectiveness and efficiency with that. And then this last one on this list here for $14,000 is also split between many funds. It's to hire an outreach consultant to make sure that we've got um, some outside resources um, on hand when we need to do a uh, deeper dive with outreach uh, and making sure the community knows what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what those impacts uh, will be. And going to the next slide here, uh, we are asking for uh, one position. It's a water system operator. Uh, this is to make sure that we've got the right resources to, to run our own water system um, and make sure that we're not getting behind on maintenance and that we can also have the right um, amount of staff on hand if we do have an emergency issue to deal with. And then um, other investments in the water fund, um, water flushing program, we just need more supplies to assist with that. Um, we're looking for a truck for uh, one of our treatment operators so that he can operate independently and not have to um, have a co-pilot moving around the city. Uh, we've got some lead and copper rule um, obligations with the state that we want to comply with. Um, there's some backflow um, uh, issues we need to address internally, and then there's a whole host of these items that are split between a number of funds that I think I've already mentioned. <coughs> Nearing the end, storm drain fund, uh, we're looking for a portable generator that if we've got a power outage, uh, our crews can come in with a generator and make sure that our lift stations don't get overrun with water and we can pump the water out of the neighborhoods. Um, and other flooding mitigation equipment, and then um, more splits for these uh, shared fund uh, investments. Uh, on the sewer side, uh, looking to get uh, sewer AI software. Um, the council will recall you authorized the purchase of a CCTV van last year. The van arrived. Um, we're getting trained on it, and uh, this is a software that's going to help analyze uh, the footage we're taking um, to prepare us for our next sewer master plan. Um, and so we're going to be more efficient uh, in the long run with that. Um, Crazy. Contract MS4 inspections, we want to uh, improve the um, fats, oils, and grease inspections we're doing uh, in the commercial properties. Uh, we've got some other equipment we're looking to get, um, and we want to uh, make sure that our, our sewer jetter uh, truck can be repaired, um, and there's some costs associated with that. Um, smart sewer covers, um, as you recall, these are the sensors on our manholes that uh, detect if we potentially are going to get a uh, sewer overflow. They've been wildly successful. We want to expand that. And I'm almost done. Um, improved parking meters. Uh, one of our work plan items is to get better at parking operations. Um, this is a modest amount of um, materials we need to actually make sure that our current system um, does not go obsolete uh, while we're studying other options. Um, there's more of these splits. Um, in the fleet fund, there's $127,000 um, for bulk fuel. This is really just to right starts our budget for our current need uh, with current price of unleaded and diesel. And uh, that is a total of $2.2 .2 million, all funds. And with that, I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. I have just a basic one, and that is, what is the metric for determining what is a capital improvement project budget item versus an operating budget fund? For example, a roof on a structure. That's in our operating budget. Why? 
traditionally, um, I'm familiar with systems where um, if it's over $100,000 or going to be multi-year or it's something of political significance, um, staff would recommend that being in the, on the capital side. Um, this roof repair is likely to be handled by our field operations group um, on a, um, a non-multi-year basis, and so that's why we proposed it in that fund. Okay. There were a couple others, but I think you provide a general explanation of the metric that's good enough for government work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the SB uh, 1383, um, uh, what, what do you call it? What kind of waste? It's uh, Organic waste. Organic waste. Uh, so this is a, uh, a mandate by the state. Are they giving us any grants or anything to They are. To so um, the, the $200,000 that... Uh, we're proposing is uh, above and beyond what our grants um, that we've already secured will allow for. Um, so we currently have an engagement with a consultant that we're using grant funds for. Uh, we anticipate there's going to be more grants into the future um, as the state uh, really is um, ramping up its enforcement on these uh, on these, this legislation. Um, and so we will stay abreast of any other opportunities there are for the grant side. Okay, great. Thank you. That's, uh, that's it for me. Anything else? I guess one follow-up. On a question I asked earlier, again, the OTS board has reached out to us with regard to expenses for maintenance. I think it's interior maintenance as well as exterior. And I guess I just wanted to understand, does the Public Works Department have a response to the request for assistance? It's up to us as policymakers. But I'm just wondering what would be the approach to try and understand what it is they're asking and whether or not it really is a city responsibility versus a responsibility of OTS? So I think it's a very complicated request that they have um, from the perspective of our MOU with OTS specifies that the city maintains the structure and the exterior and uh, OTS maintains the interior. And so our contract is, is clear in that regard. Um, and in talking uh, with Ms. Adams, the executive director, um, they are struggling on the inside uh, to maintain um, an aquarium environment uh, that's fully enclosed um, and they're, they're spending, I think, between two and three hundred, two to three hundred thousand um, dollars per year on interior maintenance, of which um, they're looking for city assistance for. Um, as it relates to the public works um, department's posture on that, um, as that um, getting in, involved in interior maintenance of the, that aquarium would be a new line of business for us, of which um, I, I don't think we have the expertise um, to get into, at, certainly at this point, uh, without understanding it more. It was certainly on a, or it was only on a reimbursement basis, which potentially that could be. Um, certainly OTS would have that expertise much more than the city. Um, and I think it be, that becomes really just a, a policy funding issue uh, for the council to, to consider. Um, and if that's something that you wanted to, to move forward, um, obviously we would need to renegotiate that MOU. Thank you. Helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be like SpongeBob SquarePants all day long taking care of that, right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Great. laughs> One word answer. <laughs> Two words. Oh, no. oh, thank you. Yeah, sorry. And last but not least. Last but not least, we'll go at gigabit speed. I promise. Okay. No. <laughs> um, so, good evening, Mayor Franklin, members of Council, uh, Miguel Guardado, uh, Information Technology Di uh, Director. Thank you for the opportunity to present the proposed budget for our Information Technology Department this evening. Um, so, I did not run out of ink. Uh, that is my budget. Uh, so uh, if you want to follow along, uh, it's on page 365 of the green binder. Um, uh, my department program chart is straightforward because uh, we are a single program. However, the department does have five distinct functions. Uh, we provide end user support, infrastructure support, application support, geographic information systems, and also IT management and administration. Um, you know, uh, our, our role here is to support all the departments within the organization to be able to provide the services to our residents and our visitors and provide it in a manner that uh, is constantly available on our web portals uh, and, our, and, our, um, and online and internally also, but then also to be able to deliver that um, in, a, in a manner that, that is secure, all right? So, um, the IT department is, uh, is currently comprised of 11 full-time positions and 
we have a total proposed expenditure for this next fiscal year of $5.4 million. Following along on page 372 of that green budget binder, um, you know, we have uh, our performance measures. Uh, and, you know, I like to highlight a couple of them here. Uh, you know, there's a couple that, uh, that, that aren't where we want them to be quite yet, uh, but I will talk to you about some, uh, some of the ones that I think are indicative, indicative of some of the work that my staff has done over the course of the last year. And so that would be the network infrastructure of time of 9.9%. Uh, this metric of 9.9% allows for up to 8.77 hours of unplanned downtime throughout the year. And, it, you know, it's, uh, our staff has worked extremely hard to identify and address single points of failure. Now, this started way, long, way before I got here, but I think it's commendable of the work that they've done. And, the, um, and, uh, and for us to be able to meet this metric, it's not an easy metric to meet. Um, and so this is key to maintaining a 24-7 city hall, which I know is super vital and super important so that we can conduct business at all hours and provide services uh, to our residents. You know, we will continue to make progress and enhance our systems. Every time that we look at them, we will look at what is the best way to make this happen and, and maintain this level of support. Um, and I just want to say that I do appreciate the support that this council and previous councils have given the IT department to be able to get here because it's not easy. It's a, it's a, it's a financial investment. Um, also, uh, the second item that I would like to point out is our fish, our, our fish prone vulnerability. Uh, this is a targeted measure that we like to main, uh, that we we'll like to keep at less than two percent. Now, compared across the industry, uh, that's two points uh, than the four percent that we see elsewhere. Um, you know, the threat, uh, our threat landscape is continually evolving, and with that, so does our training. We need to evolve um, to be able to identify these risks as they are, uh, as they're coming out, um, you know, as they say in the wild, that we're able to, uh, uh, to identify them. Um, IT will continue, and yeah, yeah uh, I know it's not a, a popular item, but we'll continue sending user regular simulated training uh, phishing testing, right? And we'll identify those clickers and, and provide like the, like the training necessary. I think it's super important that we have our staff, uh, you know, adequately prepared and able to identify these common threats. Great idea. Um, by the numbers, um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, our IT department has done a lot of great work over the year. Um, but a testament here is, you know, uh, the, the IT department supports thir uh, about 1,380 devices uh, across the organization. That is up from last year's number of 11 of 1,177. So about 203 new devices on our, on our network infrastructure have come on in this last year. Um, you know, but that is comprised of, you know, uh, computers, laptops, uh, 406 iPads and iPhones, uh, 476 desk phones and 79 copiers, printers, and things of that nature, those types of devices. Um, looking at these numbers also, I'd like to, you know, show that we are registering a 100% increase in, in our servers compared to last year's numbers. Um, you know, and this goes back to um, us now having about 100, or we have 120 servers, last year we had 60. So this goes back to the efforts uh, that staff has put into providing redundancy in our system. So redundancy means multiple servers, more servers on our environment so that we can keep those services up and running. So kudos to the team for being able to do that. Uh, we're supporting 123 applications, um, such as uh, our Tyler Enterprise Resource Planning, Entergov, Esri, GIS Mapping, Document Management, uh, with, uh, the web, uh, Website Monitoring, Granicus, just to name a few. Um, we do have uh, 60 switches, three firewalls, and those are distributed across six data centers across, the, uh, across our city. Uh, I would like to uh, pull your attention down to the did you know section. And this is uh, where you'll see a very large number of 867,503, which is the average number of incoming emails that we receive and sanitize monthly. So this is in a course of about 30 days. So Miguel's not staying up at night watching all these emails come through. We have systems that do that. Uh, but we are, we are finding uh, that we are getting more and more emails sent to us as, as phishing attacks, right? And so this proves the importance, again, of that fish-prone vulnerability testing that we conduct every, um, 
every quarter or every couple of months. It's super important because it's very easy for uh, these threat actors to, to simulate and send emails. And it just takes them, like they just have to be right once. We have to be right every single time. Um, <coughs> let's see, some of our key objectives um, for this next fiscal year is we'll continue to improve end user support uh, our city enterprise application enhancements uh, for the systems that you heard about earlier, uh, software management and better support of city departments and the public. Um, we'll continue our cybersecurity efforts, uh, you know, for that ever-changing threat landscape. Um, continue the implementation of M365 efforts, including the various applications and tools that enhance collaboration and streamline processes. Um, I'm happy to announce that we are about two months into our training. We started like the rollout in-house, and so we're hoping to have this project completed before the beginning of summer. Um, we want to upgrade the city's council chamber audiovisual and broadcasting equipment to eliminate some of the obsolete and unsupported equipment that we have in our back room. Um, you know, we have funding for this, and you can expect the uh, staff report coming your way here very, very shortly. Uh, research and implement AI technology to streamline and improve processes. AI is not just a buzzword anymore. We need to explore and find the appropriate use uh, for it to help make uh, to, to help us automate tasks and improve efficiencies in the organization. Let's see the service delivery investments uh, this year. Um, IT is um, requesting that we include the addition of a full-time office assistant. The position is needed uh, to provide clerical and administrative and technical support to the information technology department. Uh, since the department was established, these duties have been shared amongst staff. The new office assistant position will free up the staff to concentrate on their core duties. This change as a result has resulted in one new full-time position in the Information Technology Fund. Um, other um, IT budget uh, uh, investments that, uh, that we're looking for is the Emergency Operations Center EOC upgrades, or what we're calling Phase Two. Uh, this is to implement uh, the audio and video, and basically make en enhancements to our EOCs. Uh, here at fi uh, police and fire conference room and then our secondary EOC, which is at public works training room. Uh, this will uh, uh, upgrade all the equipment so we can send the video feeds, uh, do all the back end cabling and the implementation services. Uh, the second item is we have, uh, again, artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, the requested funds in support of the objective that I mentioned before, but to explore and recommend and implement an AI technology to streamline and improve process. It's also essential for you know, uh, city governments uh, like ours to approach AI investment strategically, considering such factors as need, uh, needs assessment, partnerships, ethical considerations, skill development, monitoring and evaluation, and security, of course, of these AI tools. Um, and third is interactive mapping application upgrade. Uh, the interactive mapping uh, application uh, or mapping application for staff and, and the public. So these are the active maps that we have on our websites. Uh, we, we're looking to upgrade uh, those systems for the public and also for our internal staff um, and just trying to get it to the latest version and the latest technologies uh, to provide better services. And last on this list is the phone system upgrade. Um, the city phone system, um, the, city phone, the, the city's phone system and the support is scheduled for December 31st of 2029. After December 34th, uh, 31st of this year, though, the phone system will be solely in maintenance mode, which translates to no patches and no upgrades. So the phone system will remain functional, but we will need to explore uh, the feasibility of bringing this, uh, this as a project and doing an upgrade before uh, the due date of uh, that uh, of December 31st of 2029. Um, this is not something that I can bring forward right now. There's just no bandwidth in our team to get this done. We have other things on the table, but uh, this is something that we will be um, looking at in the future. So it's important that that, that gets, uh, that, uh, that we do this to, uh, to mitigate that time frame. Um, so like I said, gigabit speed, this concludes my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have.
Just a random one, which I hope is quick, is historically the city received PEG funds from cable operators to help support the costs to yep. improve our broadcast capability. With the decline of cable, I'm just wondering, how does that impact that revenue source to help pay for some of these upgrades? I, I think it will impact it, um, but they're still on the hook for some of those services that they provide us. And so as long as we have a cable system in the city, they're that's still going to feed into our in, into our coffers. If and you can will. those funds in turn be used to upgrade our internet capability, particularly with more and more people streaming meetings instead of watching them on cable? Yeah. Um, so what I we can provide the services during the installation to be able to stream our meetings, uh, but we're just not not able. To, if I understood your your question correctly, we're just not not able to to do it after the fact. So Thank we you. can do it at the time of the upgrade. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, anything from city manager? No, this, this, well, at this time, if you have no more questions, uh, it would be appropriate to open up public comment. Okay. Opening up public comments. Don't all rush down at once. Being, uh, <laughs> Seeing we're down to just two members of the public, the chambers, anyway. <laughs> a 33% drop. Uh, what about and how about uh, Zoom? There's no request on Zoom. Okay, so we'll close public comments and ready. that uh, basically concludes the study session tonight. Uh, our next opportunity to discuss will be next Tuesday at the regular city council meeting. Uh, we have another budget study session scheduled for 5:28 if we need it. If not, we can uh, cancel that. And our goal, of course, is to adopt the budget on June 4th uh, to take effect uh, July 1 of 2024. Okay, great. Thank you. So we will adjourn to Tuesday, May 21st at 5 p.m. for closed session. <laughs>